So welcome, Professor Judith Mackay, back to Edinburgh, back to our Scotland. Thank you. Um, it's always a joy to have you visit because you've been working in, in this field of tobacco control for some time. And I wanted to ask you, how did you get into that? Well, it's welcome back, but actually this is my home base, if you could call it that, because it was here in Scotland that I graduated in medicine. It was here in Scotland that I did my six months medical internship in the city hospital with Sir John Crofton. And of course, I knew his wife, Eileen. And indeed, it was Sir John Crofton who really got me going in terms of tobacco control. And I'm talking now about the 60s. So it really feels like coming home back to Scotland, as we do every year. Mm. Sir John was an amazing, dynamic person, wasn't he? I mean, what was it like to be mentored by him? Oh, he was very dynamic. And in fact, um, to really put his place in history, uh, he was one of the first people, along with Sir Richard Doll and the Oxford people, to actually acknowledge and recognise that smoking was harmful to health. So in 1966, when I was working with him in the city hospital, I mean, this was quite his passion about the dangers of smoking. And uh, there are quite a few of us around the world who became what are known as Croftonites because we never, ever lost that influence in terms of tobacco. So um, he was certainly dynamic. And when we came back from Hong Kong on visits, he would have a list as long as your arm. You know, had I done this? Had I done that? Did I know that people? person, what about this, what about that, really right up until the time that he passed away. He was extraordinarily engaged and dynamic and he in fact was very responsible for the setting up, for example, of the Bloomberg Initiative on Tobacco Control because the person who set that up had worked with him and was a Croftonite as well. So he had very, very wide ranging global influence on tobacco control. And what I did was to work in hospital medicine for 17 years, but that was, that was enough. And then I really moved into tobacco control, but with the authority of all the clinical experience behind me. So I changed in 1984 from working in clinical medicine into preventive medicine. And what made you motivated, apart from Sir John Crofton, yeah. what motivated you to want to address tobacco issues? Why, why was it something that you felt you needed to, to get into and spend time on? There were several reasons. One of them was working in hospital medicine in Hong Kong because we had a maxim on our male medical ward in particular, the male ward, that we never admitted a non-smoker. They were coming in with stroke and heart disease and chronic lung disease and all the problems of smoking. So it was very clear to me that health would never be improved in society unless we went further back and really addressed the cause, which was tobacco. So that was certainly one reason. The second reason was that I have almost lifelong become quite a committed feminist. And in the 1980s, around the world and in Hong Kong, the tobacco industry was targeting women. Um, you know, the male rates were up at 50% and more right round Asia, but very few women smoked. So the tobacco industry moved in, um, really trying to recruit women. People, women who didn't smoke, nothing to do with brand switching, nothing. We had about 2-3% of women smoking. And, you know, I was just so outraged at this and also realised that although women's health in those days was very gynaecologically orientated, but more women were dying from smoking than from every method of contraception combined, for example. So that really tobacco was a women's issue in the 1980s. And the tobacco industry were infiltrating dress shops, putting out free cigarettes. So that was the second motivation. And then thirdly, the tobacco industry, British American tobacco itself, put out a leaflet about tobacco control. Well, it was a booklet, perhaps more than a leaflet. And it said that the um, anti-tobacco forces in Hong Kong were entirely you know, unrepresentative, um, irresponsible. They were the best source of information on tobacco and the government should listen to them. And that was my third outrage. So these three things together, plus this influence of the Croftons, both Croftons, behind me, just tipped me into working into tobacco control. And I've never looked back. So... So John Crofton was best known, I think, for pioneering the multi-drug treatment for TB. But like you, I also knew him as a passionate advocate for tobacco control work and someone who heart and soul 
would try to oppose what the industry was doing. And he was very much a moving force in, in establishing our Scotland in 1973. And his wife, Dr Eileen Crofton, a medical doctor in her own right, was the first director at the Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh. So um, what was the impression you had of those very early days of, of Ash Scotland being formed? Well, to start with, there was almost no technology. I mean, I think the fax machine hadn't even been invented, never mind things like computers. So it was that was actually a surprisingly hard part of the work um, to have to do everything more or less writing out in longhand and there was so much to be done at that stage if you looked in fact not just in Scotland but around the world the tobacco industry was advertising freely everywhere um, it was uh, there were no uh, pack warnings at all uh, there were no smoke free areas I mean the early days were an open field in terms of what needed to be done but the pioneering efforts were really quite challenging and um, the Croftons took that up with great aplomb and just decided this was what needed to be done and Eileen as much as John was very very committed and sort of led the way in many ways I think the role of Scotland internationally needs to be better understood and better recognized you know in terms of several things I mean one of which are the two Croftons and the way that they really set things up in Scotland particularly setting up ash and I think secondly some of the legislation that has taken place in Scotland has also influenced the rest of the world. There's business about, um, or the legislation rather, of not smoking in cars when children are on board and many things like that. I think Scotland has had quite a major contribution and certainly everybody identifies me with Scotland and around Asia I tend to spread the word about what's happening in Scotland as an example. Um, for example, I do in China or I've, I've had three working visits to North Korea for example and again I just let them know what the rest of the world is doing. So what Scotland does is important for Scotland but it's equally important as an exemplar for the rest of the world. And what are some of the the things that you're proud of that have happened in Southeast Asia and perhaps things that you've had a hand in explaining and, and moving forward? I think probably looking back over my now 40 years working full-time in tobacco control, I suppose one of the biggest things that I was involved with was the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, it started actually in a breakfast bar in San Francisco. I met up with Ruth Romer who said, would I have breakfast? And I said, yeah, I, I just don't do working breakfast, Ruth. No, thank you. And we'll meet later for lunch, perhaps. She absolutely insisted. And she said to me, has WHO ever thought of... She was a lawyer, a professor of law. And she said, has um, WHO ever thought of having a convention? And I misunderstood her. I thought she meant like a meeting. And I said, oh, you know, they have a lot of meetings all the time. And she said, no, no, a convention like CEDAW, the Convention for Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or the Maritime Law of the Sea, or the Rights of the Child, that kind of convention. So I said, oh, I'm, I don't think so, why? And she had thought quite a lot about it with another lawyer in America. And the World Conference on Tobacco was just coming up in Paris. And she said, why don't, can we put in a resolution at that world conference for WHO, we encourage WHO to look into forming a framework convention on tobacco control. And um, so we did exactly that and I took this resolution to WHO and in those days the reaction was very, uh, I think to put it politely, was slow. They'd never, had, WHO had never had a convention before and actually has never had one since. The Framework Convention is WHO's one and only convention on anything. Um, and, but the lawyers said it would be very difficult and it would take time. And I remember one lawyer saying to me, it'll take 10 years to get a convention passed. So my reply to that was, where do I live? And they said, well, what do you mean? Where? I said, where do I live? And they said, well, you live in Hong Kong, in China. I said, exactly, 10 years. What is 10 years? Um, in terms of Chinese thinking. You know, they think in terms of a hundred years, a million years, a thousand years. It's nothing, ten years, to get a convention through. So Ruth and I were probably the vehicles um, and the accelerators. of. And we had a meeting when Dr. Grohal and Brundtland, who used to be the Prime Minister of Norway before she became the director of WHO, um, when she came in, she wanted a special project 
and malaria was a done deal. She wanted a second one. So Richard Pito from Oxford and Neil Collishaw from Canada and myself made a presentation to her and um, on tobacco, that this should be tobacco. The time had come for WHO to really step up and take tobacco a lot more seriously. Uh, Richard presented the data in his um, very unique way. Uh, Neil Collishaw showed a graph showing how tobacco was going up and WHO funding for tobacco was going down. And I just showed pictures. I showed pictures of tobacco industry advertising and it just clicked and she just was, she was outraged as well. So tobacco became a special project within WHO, a cabinet project within WHO. And then immediately it morphed into becoming the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which now in 2023, 183 countries have ratified, become parties to, and, uh, and very few have not. And um, I think probably in global terms it really made a big difference, even just that countries were in touch with each other through the meetings, through all the, and, and now the sort of the COP meetings, um, but even at that time they were in touch with each other because what the tobacco industry were doing were going to countries like Cambodia. Uh, who will say, for example, wanting to ban advertising and imply that, A, no one in their right minds, no other country done it, so to speak, it wasn't worth doing, it didn't work, that uh, it would be very expensive, it would be a disaster, that they should have voluntary agreements, the works, the tobacco industry works. And of course, for a country like Cambodia, with little access to international advice or anything, could be quite intimidated by that, that a, a posse of tobacco industry executives and lawyers arriving on their shores. So I think the convention, it put everybody together and they could all see that, well, actually, all these other countries are doing it. We don't want to get left behind. It's accelerated the process, I think. And also, because it is a UN convention, it's across the board with government. Of course, it's not just the Ministry of Health. Everybody has to, certainly in theory, but in practice, should. Everybody should be getting involved with the international conventions. So I think it's done a great deal in terms of accelerating tobacco control worldwide. So I think that's probably one of the major things I did. But having, right through the 80s and 90s, visited all the countries in Asia, from Mongolia you know, down to Vietnam, and especially China, the, the wonderful thing for me is that every single country in the Western Pacific is now a party to the treaty. It's the only WHO region where every country has actually ratified the convention. And, you know, I just hope that all my work in the early days in countries um, and alerting them and, and sort of um, priming them almost in a sense has really helped with that. I think it has made a big difference. Um, the, the final thing I would say about the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is we had no idea how important Article 5.3 is. Mm -hmm. And what Article 5.3 says is that the tobacco industry has no place at the policy table on tobacco. Um, it is not allowed to interfere with the development of tobacco control policy. And it's the first convention in the world that has ever had a clause like that. And we just had no idea how important it would be because even since the convention was rat you know, went through and came into force, um, you know, m more than, well, almost 20 years ago now, um, when it came into force, um, I think it's quite clear that unless governments tackle the tobacco industry, they will not be successful in tobacco control. And I think that article there, how we managed to just get it in, is remarkable in retrospect, because I don't think we realised how important that would be. So Article 5.3 and its guidelines have enabled us and enabled governments and given legitimacy to governments and academia and NGOs to really challenge the tobacco industry and the way around the world it obstructs tobacco control um, measures by governments. It's a very, there's many imp problems trying to do tobacco control. We all know them, the emphasis on curative medicine rather than preventive medicine, the lack of resources, the lack of understanding of the the true impact of smoking, you know, with up to, you know, 60% of deaths from smoking. People think, oh, well, it's like any other environmental hazard. It's not. It's worse than that. There are so many impediments, but the biggest impediment is the tobacco industry. It's the biggest challenge that we face. So I think having 5.3 there adds such legitimacy to governments, actually, and, and 
in fact, the whole of society tackling tobacco industry interference in, um, nowadays. And in fact, there's even an index that is brought out every year or two years looking around the world, and it's appalling. The examples from around the world are absolutely appalling at the way and the influence of tobacco industry attempts in terms of tobacco control. So I think, again, the Framework Convention unites us on that. We share information, we share the stories. Um, we share the good stories as well as the bad stories and the challenges and how things get done. But that was incredibly important in terms of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. It's been incredibly important for Scotland, I think, to mm. see that Article 5.3 almost shows the industry for what it is. Its yes. aims are fundamentally and irreconcilably opposed to the aims of public health. Yes. And I've been working in this field since the mid-1990s, and I have seen how the industry behaves mm. and how it tries to reinvent itself or present itself as part of the health debate while at the same time actively undermining it and actively undermining it in other parts of the world with reference to what they're doing here in Scotland and the UK. Um, and I do have real concerns about what's happening here in the UK, how the industry is bringing uh, attention to all these novel and new products, to heated tobacco products, to e-cigarettes of various kinds, to um, nicotine pouches and of course they've got allies lobbying for tobacco pouches to be legalised here and it feels to me like they're almost trying to or they are very actively trying to undermine the WHO and trying to undermine Article 5.3 and trying to use their weight to stop health measures and influence health um, Discussions. I think the sad thing is it's nothing new. Mm -hmm. If you look back at some documents that were released on the tobacco industry, you'll see they've been at it for 100 years. Um, I was astonished to find how even in the 1911s and the 1920s in China, for example, how practically every billboard was a tobacco industry billboard in China from, the, from British tobacco companies and how they were recognising the danger signs as to um, individuals but governments and policies that were evolving in the middle of the last century and trying to curtail them. They were absolutely onto it and way ahead of us in many ways. So nothing really has changed. And the interesting thing is that I don't think there's a country in the world that does not have that kind of interference in tobacco in policies. And it can be very, very threatening and expensive for the governments. For example, you mentioned the new products. Now, in Hong Kong and in about 40 countries now around the world, these have been completely banned. We have banned importation, manufacture, sale of e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products. Um, people in Britain are often astonished to hear that, particularly down in England, because um, there are a couple of countries, and not many more than that, that have actually embraced e-cigarettes. The rest of the world is extremely concerned about what to do about them. They don't want an additional epidemic on top of the combustible tobacco epidemic. Um, they don't know what the ingredients are. They are concerned that it doesn't seem to help people stop smoking. They're concerned that it might be a gateway for children to start smoking. Um, they're concerned it will renormalize smoking with all these sophisticated images of e-cigarettes. And I think particularly the low and middle income countries felt they just couldn't take this on. They didn't want to let the sort of the genie out of the bottle because we reckoned in Hong Kong it would be much more difficult if they became established on the market to try and ban it in five years' time, rather than do a preemptive strike, in a sense, mm. and, um, and get them off the market, well, never get them on the market, so to speak. So quite a number of countries are taking a very different path from the UK and from New Zealand and Canada. Um, so they're, they're, in fact, quite isolated in a very different approach. Everybody's involved with wanting to do better in terms of public health. I don't doubt that for a minute. But uh, I think as time goes by, I think the more cautious approach is, is clearly the better of the various approaches towards um, the e-cigarettes and products like that. Mm. So I suppose that's back to the training that you get as a, as a clinician, as a doctor, that is a precautionary approach if you don't know what the end point is. You, are, um, you almost have a duty of care to be more cautious. 
about that's what true. you recommend. Yes, I'd never mm. connected the two before, but I think that's true, mm. to do no harm and, uh, and to prevent. But uh, the interesting thing is that doctors are still not really trained properly in terms of preventive health. The whole emphasis is given to disease, um, disease treatment, mm. actually. Um, you know, with surgery, with anaesthetics. And I think, actually, if you were to step back and look at the last century, there was a development of, anti- of drugs, of antibiotics in particular, of anaesthesia and surgery. And I think the whole of health con- thinking sort of shifted towards that m- more interventionist approach. And I think we now realise it has its place. I mean, if I broke my leg, I'd certainly like to have it set in hospital. But I think the I think it, there's a pendulum swinging back into recognising this is not enough. It just won't. The old medical mo- the ni- the twentieth century medical model of care is not enough to improve the health of the community. Mm. Thank you. So. Our Scotland, in the last 50 years, we've been involved in a number of exciting advances, mm. um, shutting down tobacco advertising, cleaning the air in enclosed public spaces, um, trying to create the environment where the next generation can grow up and live smoke-free and tobacco-free. Um, what should we be looking to for the next 5, 10, 50 years even? Well, I would say, firstly, more of the same. I think Scotland's clearly on the right track of what it's done because it's um, it's done the right things. It's brought the smoking rates down. It's raised public awareness. It's educated children. Um, it's helped people who want to quit smoking and so on. So, I mean, all of those things we know can be effective. Um, implementing them fully I suppose is one aspect you have to be careful about because many countries will say oh we've got a smoke free law but in fact the law is not as well um, implemented and uh, and um, as really it should be so there's just too many leaks all around it in fact they say if every if every country were to implement the framework convention on tobacco control fully then smoking rates would be drama- would drop dramatically around the world so there's this whole question of making sure that laws are working um, th- there are newer ideas here people are looking into uh, having a smoke free generation and for example not allowing anybody born or any child born after a certain date to ever have access to tobacco in the country um, there are um, interesting sort of thoughts about whether regulating nicotine might be a good idea um, and I think where Scotland has actually for me as well I remember coming and talking to you some years ago about the legislation but then you were then moving into looking at the sort of social determinants of health and that was quite a shock to me I mean we'd been struggling in Asia just to get laws in place and you were not saying oh it's done it's finished by any means but you were saying that it's these social determinants of health not not the commercial determinants like the tobacco industry, they're always there and they really need to be tackled. But the social determinants, I think, I think that was really quite an eye-opener to me how, in a sense, our next step after all this legislation throughout Asia should really be looking at things like that and how it's the poor that smoke, it's the poor that suffer. Um, it's the poor countries that suffer, but even within a country, it's the poor that really are bearing the brunt of this epidemic at the moment. It was the middle classes who first started and the middle classes who first quit. So, I mean, just adjusting everything to understanding that has actually helped guide me in terms of where our next steps are in Asia. I think it's part of the real strength of the tobacco control community is that through that kind of dialogue, we make progress and we work together and it's the only way that we have the capacity to tackle an industry that is financially well resourced and can buy in PR and lobbying and advertising and design features and all the rest of it. It can buy almost anything. I mean, it is such a wealthy industry. If you put all the big names that you think of, like Coca-Cola and others together, the tobacco industry just exceeds them in terms of its... um, And more than the GDP of countries. I mean, it's just astonishingly wealthy and well-resourced and very clever, very cunning. Um, When I first started working in tobacco control, I thought for about... 10 days maybe I can you know work with this industry it lasted not even 10 days 
because I realise they're there to sell cigarettes. They're required to by their shareholders, and we are there to stop them doing that. There actually isn't a middle way. I don't think there is a middle way at all. It's perfectly possible to work with businesses. For example, if a, if a business or a chain of stores or something wanted to go smoke-free, of course, I mean, we would work with them immediately to try and... Or, um, or, or buses or trains or all of that implementation of smoke-free areas. Um, but in terms of working with the tobacco industry, I, I just don't think it can be done. Mm. I think, regretfully, I've come to yes. the, exactly the same conclusion. Regretfully, yes. Yeah. yes. And they will always go for people who are vulnerable or excluded mm. or just represent a market that they can make profit from. Yes. And the amazing thing is, even in tiny, tiny Pacific Islands, that you could practically put the population into this room, um, they they are just as aggressive there in terms, of, and they will make pack warnings for an unbelievably small population in whatever language they're required to. I mean, they're just they're they're force they are a force around the world to be reckoned with. And uh, you know, I've had quite a few problems with the tobacco industry myself. They've ended up, and they and their supporters and. Um, so, um, you know, smokers' rights groups have called me every name under the sun. They've likened me to Hitler. They say I'm a jihadist. Um, they've said that, you know, I was an interfering busybody. I, I mean, just unbelievable. They've twice threatened me with um, lawsuits that they've never followed up, and both of them were very public. So it was, once was, in fact, on air on radio, television, Hong Kong. And it was, of course, never followed up. It's just a way of trying to put it into people's minds. Maybe she's not as quite as reliable with the statistics or her information. And also it's very threatening and intimidating being threatened with a lawsuit by the tobacco industry because, you know, that could go on 20 years and really ground you. So, um, it, but now that's changed completely since the beginning of Ash and since the Croftonites. We were lone voices in the wilderness in those days. Whereas now there's a, I wouldn't say an army of people, but I think people now are in public health courses and masters of public health. I mean, I teach at Oxford and at Cambridge and at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm giving a lecture next week, in fact, at Cambridge on you know political advocacy and the tobacco industry. I think that there are now, and the Bloomberg and the Gates people are now employing a lot of people around the world. It's almost like, a, a sort of professional community. There's meetings in the United Nations, not just on the Framework Convention, there's high-level meetings on non-communicable diseases. I mean, this was unthinkable 50 years ago when Ash Scotland was set up by uh, the Croftons. Um, the idea of having a high-level meeting in Moscow, which occurred a few years ago, on non-communicable diseases and tackling tobacco would have been quite unthinkable. But interestingly enough, talking about high-level meetings, the first international meeting, the Americans called it, of world smoking control leaders, took place in 1985 in Washington. And it was the first opportunity. The American Cancer Society organized it. And it was the first opportunity for all of us from around the world to get together. Um, no female plenary speakers in those days, I might say, but we did get together. I met my, a Chinese counterpart for the first time, and my goodness, that was a relationship that bore fruit for many, many years as an entree for my working in China. And um, the first meeting, the very first meeting in China um, was held not in Beijing. It was thought to be too sensitive to hold it in the capital. Um, it was held in Tianjin, just downriver from Beijing, because even in those days, this was in 1987, tobacco control was thought to be too sensitive a topic. But the Croftons were at that meeting. I mean, they were very involved early on of carrying the imprint, in a sense, of Scotland around the world and participating, and it was at that meeting in Tianjin that some of our counterparts from China, Richard Pito, the Croftons, myself, we actually were asked to draft a tobacco control law for China, the first one, which came into effect in 1992, pretty much as we'd actually drafted it, to tell the truth. So, you know, if you go back historically, there's lots of really nice connections 
between Scotland and the rest of the world. And that very invol early involvement of getting the message out that tobacco control really needed to be done by all countries and could be done by low and middle income countries as well as the rich countries. And actually, the first ever tobacco control legislation, everybody credits Norway with it in 1973. Not a bit. 1970 in Singapore. Singapore was the first place in the world to pass laws, national laws, on um, banning advertising, such as they thought it in those days. I mean, we hadn't got into sponsorship and stuff. Banning advertising and creating smoke-free areas. Um, so, I mean, Asia, I think, I think needs better recognition of what it has done and what it can do. It's not that somehow the Western world has done it and got it right and is any sense superior in terms of its knowledge. Sometimes the low and middle income countries have done really well. Um, Singapore was the first to ban duty free cigarettes. Um, uh, Thailand set up a system where 4% of all tobacco and alcohol tax went into public health, particularly tobacco and alcohol. Um, we were, Hong Kong was the first to ban smokeless tobacco in 1986. It's not just historical, but right up to the present day, the low and middle income countries have done well. But I think the, the, the example and the assistance from the um, high income countries has been really, really helpful. Mm. Yes, everyone brings something to that yes. table, don't they? And I feel it would be helpful if the UK was conscious of its role as a global citizen, both in learning from some of those other nations who've had to do so much with so little, yes, and in doing what it can to set a strong example on the world stage. So I would like to see us be brave um, at UK and at Scottish level in terms of how we tackle tobacco and what we do. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. But I would also like to thank you for once again inspiring us. Um, you've talked about Sir John and, and Lady Eileen Crofton. And With respect and very fondly. I mean, I was really very fond of both of them and they have guided my career right from 1967. That's the truth of it. Um, and had I not worked with John Crofton in 1967, I, I just might never have been initiated into the idea of tobacco control and got involved as much as I had done. And in turn, I mean, through that, really working, as I said, with all the countries in Asia and just helping them get up and running through the 80s, 90s, even to this day, but especially then, just helping them getting up and running, never telling them what to do, but, you know, working with them, you know, what have you done, what do you think might be the next step? Um, well, this is what they did in France, or this is what they did in Scotland. You know, is it possible to do the same kind of thing there? Just encouraging them and working with them. Um, I, I put it all down to the Croftons. <laughs> well, I think the Croftons would be incredibly proud of you um, because you have taken that energy out to so many parts of the world. You have shared respectfully what you've seen that works and what you're kind of seeing that maybe isn't necessarily going to go well. Um, I always find it inspirational when you come to Scotland and thank you for making time in what's been a very busy schedule to come and meet with us. Well, thank you, Sheila. And I'm full of admiration, respect and mutual learning. Every time I come, I learn something from Ash Scotland that um, I export. <laughs> it's an export to the rest of the world. Well, that's very much appreciated. So, <laughs> yeah. Professor Mackay, thank you. Once again, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Sheila.